Hello, and welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything else along the way. I'm your host this time, Brian Broom, and I'm uh, joined (laughs) by Greg Unninger. Uh, Today, we're going to be talking about repentance and uh, specifically the models for repentance that we are given in scripture and the importance that scripture lays upon them. So, Greg, why don't you go ahead and get us started? Well, we have our uh, our path of discussion laid out for the next few months. And I saw the word repentance and I thought, oh, obviously this must be David's repentance, which would be a great thing to talk about. But we just had David's last word, so we can't do that, apparently. And so I looked to see what, what in the world uh, this was all about. And it begins with this. This is Solomon having dedicated the temple and having offered prayers to God, and the glory of God has filled the new temple. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven and there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I set pestilence among the people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. The first time I ever ran into this verse, I was a young kid. Uh, It was an election season, and my parents were supporting a third-party candidate. And he used this this verse, and it it seemed very beautiful and powerful to me as as a young kid. But I didn't know where it was, and I didn't, at that point in my life, have even a Strong's Concordance. It is the Concordance, the back of this Bible. And I did a lot of searching for it and finally found it. But it has since become a very popular verse. Anytime an election season comes up or anytime we want to talk about revival. Interestingly enough, the third-party candidate who quoted this out loud later was found to have been unfaithful to his wife. You know, so. And yet repentance is, is a real thing. Before we go on to talk about it, I suppose this disclaimer, some theologians with with some sense of, of uh, hermeneutical balance will say, but that in this particular case was a promise to Israel in the context of the temple, and therefore we should not press it too far anyplace else. There's a little bit of truth in that. For instance, when he says, my people, that does not mean America. Mm. Uh, I think that one we need to put right on the table. No, I mean, should America repent, obviously. But that's not the nature of the promise. This is a covenant promise to covenant people. And so for to make an immediate application into the new covenant era, this would be a command to the church. If the church has grown cold and wayward, and as a consequence, her ministry and her effect upon the nation around is having ill effects, then the church needs to seek God's faith, turn from her wicked ways and such. Uh, Having said that, we certainly have ample grounds in the Old Testament and in the New for calling all nations to repentance. Uh, God commands all men everywhere to repent, Paul says. And even in the Old Covenant, we have Nineveh, who's called, actually not called to repent, but does. All all Jonah says is, um, 40 days and then it will be overthrown and the people themselves know enough they, they theology. They figure out the rest. <laughs> yeah, they figure out, maybe, <laughs> it may be that God, and, 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 they, and they do repent, and, and God is the Lord of all nations, and we all have to answer to him, and particularly with in view of the Great Commission, which calls us to disciple not individuals only, but all nations to Christ, we can make an application. It's indirect but it's close enough that if a nation humbles itself and turns from its sin, God will have mercy and there will be visible external signs of his, of his favor as they pursue and continue in their repentance. That, that runs very counter to Western culture as it currently stands. We're very individualistic Mm -hmm. centered and Rarely ever does corporate thought ever enter into the picture. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Well, you remember at the tail end of uh, the last episode, you were bringing up that uh, strain within Presbyterianism that says that uh, 
nations aren't really nations until they have a formal covenant with Jesus. Right. And we kind of look at that in the scans and said, uh, no, that's not really the way that works. Yeah. <laughs> Go- government is by nature covenantal. The authority that G- Christ gives is by nature covenantal. And just because the people involved don't recognize it does not free them from said covenantal responsibility, nor co- said covenantal sanctions. Mm. Uh, we cannot say that God does not judge among the nations because they're not his people. He only judges his people. That'd be a rotten way to conduct um, a New Testament economy. Yeah, all of you nations who are sinning against me, go have fun. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to criticize you. I'm not going to bring any punishment upon you. But my church, on the other hand, well, the church does receive special attention. Judgment does begin at the house of God. Mm-hmm. Those of us who draw closer to the throne are more accountable. But if judgment begin with us, then what? where will the ungodly appear? Uh, Apostle continues. So, yeah, corporate responsibility is a thing. We generally do think of repentance as something I myself do, if that is if we think of repentance at all. But it's something I do, and how dare I judge other people and call them to account. And if I sit, if I repent, my life should get better, but what does that have to do with, with the rain, the sunshine, the earthquakes, the tornadoes, or the general state of our economy? Well, if you're the only one doing it, it may not be a whole lot. But God does deal with people corporately. And um, some of the mistakes that people have made in reading the sanctions of the covenant in Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26, is to say, well, this is what will happen to you if you come to Christ and you and you obey his law. Now, he's not talking to individuals. He's talking to Israel as a whole. There were many people in Israel down through this millennia and a half of its existence who were faithful while everyone else around them was unfaithful. And the the faithful went through the persecutions, they went through the famines, they went through the droughts, they went through the pestilence. God did not free them from the corporate sanctions that he brought against an unbeliever people. And you're right, we have a, we have a hard time with that. Shouldn't it all just be me and God and what do other people have to do with it? So that, in this mm. particular verse, does say that the nation or the people, the covenant group, does need to repent. But um, do you have any other thoughts on that before we pursue the idea of what repentance looks like? Um, I think just just a passing note that um, there is a very good, like, I, I want to say it's it might be a bit of an overreaction, but there's a good reaction of disgust to people who look at passages in the Old Testament and basically say, this is for, you know, you today. And, mm-hmm. you know, you think of Jeremiah 29, 11, which has been used and abused uh, in, in various ways for prosperity gospel types uh, and all that. But there is, in fact, a real way that Jeremiah 29, 11 actually applies to the life of the faithful today as well Mm -hmm. because at the very least it is something that is bound up in christ and Mm -hmm. we need to recognize that when when the old testament speaks to israel or about the land or about things like this that these are things bound up in the person of christ and that therefore they there is a fulfillment for the people of god somehow not that it's the same in every verse or anything like that, but mm. you know, there's an overreaction, which is to say, no, no, nope, nope, that doesn't even apply at all because it was talking to Israel, yeah. and that's an overreaction. So it is, and, and this brings to mind some of the, the contra- minor controversies I've been in, on the edge of for the last few weeks, having to do with covenant continuity. Can you look at the Old Testament and say, well, this is for? The church, because God said it, he said it for anywhere from 4,000 to 1,500 years, depending which where in the Bible we are. And, and do we say, and this too belongs to the church, or do we say, no, nope, old covenant, gone, done. That was never something God intended for us. Our privileges, our uh, blessings are far more spiritual or internal or real or something. Uh, and, and it is easy to err in either direction to try to bring it across directly. Now, this the Bible says this, and the New, the New Testament church is, is the New Testament Israel, and whatever God said applies exactly and directly. That can be dangerous. Yeah. But uh, at least as dangerous 
is the idea of that's Old Testament. It doesn't apply here. Uh, it does apply because it's the same God. Human nature has not changed. God's, and I actually had to look to see what the Jeremiah passage was. The thoughts that God thinks to us are still good. And, and they're no less good because we've moved into the New Covenant, nor were his thoughts toward Israel less good because that was the Old Testament. And, you know, he was he was thinking about giving them a nice house and a dog or something, whereas us, he's giving us heaven. That's that, that we can't do that or we shouldn't do that. <laughs> it's, it's, God's nature has not changed. What God values has not changed. Yeah. And man existing as both a temporal and eternal creature, as both body and soul, has not changed the the power of the new covenant is that it can actually accomplish what the old covenant promised and the old covenant promised in types and shadows and signs and symbols yes. but what it promised was the new covenant reality and, and i think that sometimes we get the idea that god has for a while maintained competing mm. relationship structures the old covenant did one thing with one people and the New Testament does something very different with the new people. And there was that moment of overlap for 40 years, but, you know, we're not even going to think about that because we don't understand the Old Covenant very well anyway, and it doesn't matter because we're in the New Covenant. Rather than saying that everything God promised in the Old Covenant pointed to the New Covenant and what it would do, it wasn't a yeah. different kind of promise. Now, along the way, there were some there were some types and shadows that perhaps are not identical to what we have, and yet, Abraham was promised that he would be heir of the world. Jesus says, go yeah. make disciples of all nations. And Paul, commenting on Abraham being heir of the world, doesn't pull that back and say, well, that was nice for him, but now you have something. You don't get the world. You get heaven. He does not do that. Nope. God preached before the gospel to Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So part of the job of expositors and theologians, both biblical and, and systematic, is to see how this hermeneutic brings the Old Covenant promises to us. Mm. So here we have something very specific. Uh, we're not at, we're not worshiping at Solomon's Temple. We have no promises about our church buildings, but we do have the temple, which is the church. Yeah. And uh, America is not God's people. <clears throat> we would dearly love for America to become God's people by faith in Christ, but in the meantime. There is a God's people called the church, a covenanted community, that is quite capable, in, at least theoretically, and in, in, within God's grace, of repenting. And, and, and God is more than capable of healing our relationships and our land and our finances and our economy as we do this. So, uh, that is, of yes. pouring out the blessings that the church receives so that they see beyond us in what we often call common grace so that we become a channel <clears throat> blessing for the world both yep. spiritually which is primary you know, relationship with god and christ but then everything that comes with that uh, god claims us he claims our children he claims our stuff that hasn't yep. changed so as we proceed through the rest of the old covenant over the next several months lord willing this is something we will probably come back to again you know, why do you keep teaching from the old covenant because it's foundational it, is. It, sets, it sets the pattern. It's the ABCs, and then some of this has to be translated, as it were, which is which is a, a good image. Uh, the, the Bible uses the idea of resurrection and, and ascension to heaven as translation, uh, being lifted out of one language into another, but the but the sense is the same. Mm. Uh, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, not in the sense of brand new, but in the sense of something radically transforming has happened and yeah. so the old covenant the reality is there so they say the same god the same problem of sin the same promise of christ the only difference is he has come and the work is finished so all of well, that said <laughs> and just and. to like all all of that that you explained was wonderful and i think the way to just um really succinctly put it into a short sentence mm -hmm. is that we are affirming that the substance of the old and the new covenants is identical. Yeah. Yeah, we have there, to. We're not, we're not dealing with one way to God and now this new better way to God. We're dealing with this This is the way to God mm -hmm. and 
the only thing that makes the new covenant new is that it's the the substance it's it's the the reality mm-hmm. using substance in a different way yeah. there than the first time <laughs> i said it so that said when we come to the new covenant the new testament we should not be surprised to see this word repentance nor should we be bothered by people who say repentance that's so old testament no that is so new testament that's so man's relationship with god in christ demands repentance repentance the greek word <coughs> metanoia means to change your mind or to turn around and since we are all conceived and born of sin if we're going to have, walk with god and have a relationship a good relationship with him we do have to turn around we do have to change our mind we have to stop walking in the direction that leads to hell and damnation and walk to our god now we have to come in christ the, the straight gate is christ himself and there is no other way. We can't simply uh, reverse our obedience patterns and think that that's going to fix anything, anything. Now, again, last time we talked about outward repentance is better than no repentance, but not by a lot. It, it is If you are a serial killer, it would be good for you to stop killing people. We, we know that. Uh, if you've been cheating on your wife and you want a better marriage, it would be good to stop cheating on your wife. Yes, this is so. These are external changes. And God can, may, and often does honor these to some extent. But true repentance is repentance from the heart. It's a change in our basic nature that's wrought by the Holy Spirit through the preaching of the gospel. And uh, when we come to the New Testament, we do find a passage in Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, where he sort of sums up what repentance is like. Now, amongst Myself and my friends, we often have the joke that 2 Corinthians was translated by the Scots. It's not completely a joke. It really was. And as you read through 2 Corinthians in the authorized version, there are expressions where you say, what does that mean? I I will read this passage in the King James. The the problem is the New King James and the ESV don't do a whole lot better, which suggests that the Greek is difficult. But I think it gives us some starting points to talk about. So this, this is... 2 Corinthians chapter 7, or I suppose the context. The context is, uh, it shows up in 1 Corinthians. There's a man in the congregation who is living in sin with his stepmother, his father's wife. And the church didn't do anything about this, didn't say anything about it, besides acknowledge the fact, because Paul somehow knew about it. But they didn't feel that that they had to pronounce any kind of criticism or, or official judgment. And Paul says, what's that all about? You're puffed up. Apparently, they thought that they were proud that they were so inclusive. They were proud that their the grace in them was so great it can embrace even this horrible thing without a blink. And Paul says, uh, "No, uh, you need to excommunicate this man." In fact, Paul does a long distance excommunication, and that was First Corinthians. Second Corinthians, the message is, "Hey, he repented. This is wonderful, and you need to welcome him back and and, and receive him, lest he be swallowed up of much grief." And and that's the context for talking about this and that of course was not Corinth's only problem they had you know were suing each other in court visiting prostitutes uh getting drunk at the Lord's Supper uh denying the resurrection there are a whole host of things they needed to fix and so in that context Paul says uh in verse 9 now I rejoice not that you were made sorry sorry but that you sorrowed to repentance We can think here of Judas and Peter. They both were very sorry about what they did. They both wept tears and and walked away from everybody else into the darkness. But Peter's tears were unto repentance and Judas's were to self-destruction. He did not repent, although he was very sorry. Just because people cry and cry lots of, cry a bucket of tears does not mean that their heart has changed, just that they are feeling the weight perhaps of the consequences of their sins. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us and nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. This is the good repentance. You'll never be sorry you did. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now here's the verse. This is Second Corinthians 7, verse 11. For behold, the selfsame thing, that you sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, Yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. 
in all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. So he's talking about their uh, the repentance for their own actions, for, for the sin that was in their midst, and for their failure to deal with sin. So there's a couple things overlapping here, which sort of explains some of the words he uses. Uh, as I said, when I when I first studied this, uh, I found the, the English difficult, and I went to a number of sources, and I still think someone more versed in Greek could do a better job than I've done. But I think there's some things here that we can see. First of all, carefulness. The New King James says diligence. The ESV says earnestness. In other words, repentance is not a slack half-hearted, yeah, I'm kind of sorry, I guess, about something. Yeah, I should have. Yeah, I made some mistakes. Who doesn't? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I sinned against you. How about other people? Huh? Other people? Well, no, that was just, you know, and I sinned against Did you sin against Well, yeah, God. I mean, it's primarily I sinned against God. And, <laughs> but I've talked to God, we're okay, you know. So that's that's not being careful, diligent, or earnest yeah. in your repentance. Very it's, uh, this is a, a strange sort of uh, object example of this, but I was watching a, a, a TV show um, with my wife, and one of the characters is, uh, is a nobleman, and he essentially walks all over who is his, you know, the, this character's love interest and because she's not a noble woman mm -hmm. yeah. and she's a she's a servant and at some point she she breaks and she goes like you're you're being very rude you're a guest in my house and you've done nothing but just act like the king because mm -hmm. you're a nobleman and he he's very sorry he, he he speaks to her and he says you know you're right i i'm, I'm i apologize that was not fair to you. I will do something to make it up for you. And he goes, go for a walk. I'll, I'll make dinner for us. He's never cooked a day in his life. <laughs> and uh, at which point he, he calls his manservant over and says, go get two dinners from the palace kitchens and <laughs> proceeds to pretend that he made that. Yeah. And then, and also the entire time it's like, then she gets mad at him for that. It's like, you lied to me. That's not great. That's not a good look either. And, he goes, I, I have a lot to learn. And he does like the whole big show thing again of yeah. like being sorry. But then he turns around and is like exactly as arrogant and condescending and rude to the manservant again. And it's yeah. like he learned nothing after all. You just yeah. like the pretty girl. <laughs> right. And it becomes a, a question of what do you have to do to get what you want? Yeah. Or what, what, what are the magic words I'm supposed to say so that we can get on and I can get back to pursuing my own interests? Yeah, you know, this this what Paul is calling for is a seriousness about this, an understanding of of how, of how bad sin is, and of who all it's affected, and how deep it reaches in your heart. Not terribly long ago, I was dealing with a person. I will be vague here, who said, "I I get my sin. I I have done this," and it was true. The person had done this, but I was sitting back thinking, I don't think you're ready for repentance yet because yes you you're confessing the surface appearance but just in talking to you there's there's stuff behind this there are there are root sins that you haven't dealt with yet mm. and um you know it's, it's easy for us to see the thing that we've done it's an action we were caught at it probably we've been called on the carpet for that and we get okay that was wrong and I'm sorry, and not only sorry for getting caught, but I am I am really sorry I did that. That was wrong. But we don't pursue further to see, and why did we do that? What are what are the root sins? And this is something <clears throat> in my late stage in life, not that old, but I'm getting there, where I'm beginning to look at things I've struggled with for a long time and see, yeah, that's really sinful, but now I'm beginning to see what's beneath it. Mm. And it's scary because it's ugly. It's it's oh I Never thought of myself that way. I mean, in the abstract, sure, I know the theology. I know what sin is like and would be autonomy and all that. But I'm actually seeing it myself and saying, ugh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, you know, there's a lot to pull out there. And I, obviously, I can't do it without the Holy Spirit's work in me. But that, I need to be earnest in pursuing <clears throat> the Spirit and asking for his help and confessing what I do see. And, of course, the, I, I think we maybe all have seen the, uh, the progression in Paul's thinking from before he came to Christ, he can say, I was blameless just touching the law. 
<clears throat> and but by the time we're through Paul's query, he says, I'm the chiefest of sinners. Uh, not that he had suddenly got worse, but that he saw more clearly. Mm. And the more we repent, the more we see there is more to repent of. Yeah. The next word, and, and this is one where I had a little bit of trouble. I'm still doing some research just before we started. The King James clearing of yourselves. The ESV says, what eagerness to clear yourselves. That doesn't really improve on it. The word, the Greek word is a, a apologia in the sense of a formal defense, not, not saying I'm sorry, but making a formal defense. Paul's not praising excuse making. Well, you see, Paul, but there were reasons we had to do this. The, the, the nature of the offense or the nature of the apology seems to be after the fact saying, look, yeah, here's what we did. Here's how, here's how, since your letter, here is what we have done to fix it. This is how serious we got. We can write up, if necessary, we can write up a task map and an after action report of all that we did to fix this because we were serious about fixing this. And we want you to know that you don't have to worry. It has been dealt with. You know, and that's always encouraging when someone under your authority, in my case, often students, uh, as an elder, parishioners, come and say, yeah, this is where I was. And I think God showed me this. He showed me this. And so I've done this. I've done that. I've done that. Not that we're saved by works, but that true faith and true repentance is going to generate some changes in lifestyle and some recognition that there are some people you shouldn't be hanging out with, some things you should not be watching, some sites on the computer you should not be going to, ways of dealing with people where you have, as you, your example was a good one, where you've been rude to this lady. You've been presuming upon her. Now you're being rude to the servant. These are all things. Just changing them is not going to change anything. But until they change naturally, or supernatural, because as the change comes organically out of your repentance and the faith of Christ, mm -hmm. uh, we have good reason to say, you're not repentant yet. Uh, or at least the repentance has not gone deep enough to change things that matter. And when the repentance does work that deeply, we should be able to sit down and say to our parents, to our pastor, to our spouse, to whoever, this is what I've done. I, 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 I am taking this. This is where husbands and wives <coughs> often need to sit down and say, look, honey, this, I, I hear you. I've listened to you. I've taken this before God. I've searched my heart. I really get it. And as a consequence, here are things I will not be doing anymore. And here are some things I will be doing. And again, that can easily degenerate into legalism. But the flip side is that if the repentance is true, there will be external changes, which we can catalog. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you've been struggling, let's say, with pornography, and if you come to your wife and say, and get rid of the TV, blocking all the channels uh, on, on the Internet. Uh, in fact, I'm going to I'm the Internet. The my computer's going to be out here in the open where no one where I can't do anything without everybody watching me. That in itself does not prove true repentance. But contrast is, yeah, honey, um, I've talked to God about this and we're OK, so you don't need to worry anymore. You're going to change your thing? Oh, no, because, you know, my heart's pure now. I don't need to worry about anything. Oh, no. no. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's that's not yeah. as comforting somehow. <laughs> it's really not. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, think about how many number of times that has functionally been what people say when, you know, they're in positions of power and yeah. like a, a, not positions of power necessarily, positions of authority in the church. Mm -hmm. And they basically say, yep, this this is a, a thing that's happened, but I'm growing through it now. And uh, we're just going to go right back to business as usual. Yes. God said I'm clear. Yeah. Between me and sin is a personal matter. Between me and God, I've cleared it. Trust me. We can go back to the way things were. <clears throat> well, yeah, I see the way that things were was where the problem started. So something needs to change here. And, and, and again, the appeal will be, no, you're asking for legalism. No, we're asking for reality. A reality that can be chronicled, described in words measured out promises can be made i will not do this and you're having an affair with the girl at the office all right well either uh, if i'm her boss i can fire her, i suppose depending i can quit i can ask for a transfer at the very least i can make sure that we are never alone in the same room at the same time and this is how i'm going to do that as opposed to no i will never lust after her again yeah we're going to work side by side late hours but it's okay the wife is not going to buy that, and she shouldn't. No and, and so this this apology, this defense of, 
he, we, we are, in fact, doing all that we need to do to clean up our act. We're looking into things. We're asking the right questions. We're exercising church discipline. We ourselves are making repentance. And we're not just blaming this guy over here who fell in the sin. We're blaming ourselves for not having helped him and dealt with this. We are taking responsibility for the body of Christ that we have endangered by allowing this thing to fester in the body. And so we begin to look more broadly and see all of the things and then begin to show how we are trying to deal with them, how we are putting the grace of Christ to practical effect in our lives. And for antinomians, all this is still going to sound like legalism. Well, of course. Because you know, we don't want to be told what to do. God can tell us, but we're, we generally come down with whatever I've done was good enough for God because, yeah, how, why would it not be? The next word in 2 Corinthians is indignation. And that's, I think the other translations use the same word. Indignant, to be thoroughly displeased and upset with something. Repentance leaves us indignant at sin and ourselves, for we understand at last that we have offended God. The repentance almost angry with sin, particularly his own. There comes a point in repentance where we finally get it. We look at ourselves and say, I am stupid. No, I am rebellious. <laughs> I have let this fester. I deceived myself. I hurt other people. Mm. I have damaged relationships. And it's me. And I really wish I could blame. No, I don't. I've passed pride to blame people. It's me. And I take that and it hurts and I'm sad. And I'm mad at myself. I'm angry with myself. And I see we get a little glimpse of God's anger with sin. Yep. So there's a danger in a lackadaisical approach of, um, yeah, well, you know, it's all right. God forgives sins. I, I confess my sins every night. Yeah, we're, we're, we're good. Again, this is sin. I, I, if there is a single theme through all of these words, it's that repentance is a very serious business because sin is a very serious danger. And yes. anything that does not force us to do heart searching, to, as an old radio program used to say, face ourselves and think, uh, examine ourselves, as Paul says, with regard to the table. Uh, is is insufficient. It might be a start, maybe, but it's not. It's not what God's demanding here. Fear, John Gill says, fear not of hell and damnation. Well, unless you really aren't believing, but uh, a fear of God. What he else other places calls a, a filial reverence for God, and a fear lest the corruption should spread in the church. Matthew Henry speaks of an awful, an awful fear of God, a caution, a cautious fear of sin, and a jealous fear of ourselves. Mm. We do really, and this is something that we, I've kind of mentioned, but I think we should we should talk for just a second. When we sin, and since we are, as you said at the beginning of this, in a corporate relationship with others, this thing called the body of Christ, the church, the local church in particular, when I sin. I do risk the danger of bringing God's wrath upon the entire congregation. And just because my sin was little and private does not mean that I am not endangering everybody by my sin. Mm. We need to understand that. Uh, when Paul describes what was happening in Corinth, he says, many are weak and sick, sickly among you, and many sleep. He does not tie it to, you people who have sinned, this is happening. But because there is sin in the congregation I've dealt with, this is happening, and the implication seems to be that it's happening to people who may not themselves directly have participated in these sins, or though perhaps in some sense, or in the unbelief of the body generally. But when we sin, we have to realize that punishment may be coming to everybody. Just, you know, a man who cheats on his wife and he gets caught, or even if he doesn't get caught, that's going to have repercussions in his family. Yep. He cannot say, no, that was just between me and the woman Okay, so my wife, but I tried to keep it from my wife so she would not be affected by it. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> it's a very yeah. out of touch yeah. way of processing the situation. And the fact is that, you know, any other sin is equally corporate. Yeah. Because if you murder someone else, <laughs> the other person is very much affected. <laughs> As is his family, mm -hmm. his friends, everyone around you, everyone, everyone who trusted you and relied on you is affected. Yep. And that's just for bringing And again, God holds the congregation responsible. If the congregation does not act, 
then the congregation may expect God's chastening on them as well for not dealing with the cancer. You leave the cancer in the body alone long enough, the body's going to die. And you cannot say, well, there was cancer in the, I don't know, the liver. But, you know, we like the liver. The liver's nice. The liver does good things. We didn't want to disturb the liver. So we just let the cancer roll along. And we're sure that God will take care of it somehow. Well, God will. And it's called death. Oh. And, and again, so we need to go back to this idea of corporate or covenantal thinking where we are members of one body. And what one of us does, if one suffers, the whole body suffers. And that's Paul. That's scripture. Uh, the next word is, um, or phrase in the King James, vehement desire. We don't say vehement anymore, or vehemence very much. The ESV says longing, a desperate desire, Matthew Henry says, for a thorough reformation of what has been amiss in reconciliation with God. So again, we're, uh, these, these, these phrases keep overlapping and intertwining. Yeah. Again, getting serious, really seriously desiring to get things fixed, to make things right, to Put right what once went wrong and um to to bring about substantial healing we can't undo the past and and it's it is naive and childish to think that if i say i'm sorry then everything can go back to the way it was uh, in many cases that's not possible but we can at least go forward on firm ground that ground being the blood of christ if we are willing to be honest and seriously pursue uh forgiveness god's forgiveness first of all and repentance and forgiveness from one another true repentance can never be mm. lukewarm two i think more um zeal yeah, two more. you know zeal and revenge zeal we have that word <laughs> to be zealous about something that means to be thoroughly committed to it be passionate about it matthew henry calls this a mixture of love and anger a zeal for duty and against sin John Gill speaks of a zeal for God and his glory, for restoring the discipline of the church, for the doctrines of the gospel, the ordinances of Christ's house. Zeal is desire on fire, an intensity of desire, Calvin says. So I guess this is what we keep saying. It, 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 it's not oxidatical, I can now say that word. It's not laid back, it's not chill, it's not, yeah, well, I dealt with that last night, it took five minutes or so. It, may require a lot of heart searching, a lot of prayer. It may require weeks and months of coming to terms with what you did and what is at the bottom of it. And uh, I like to keep coming back to that. Uh, we, we can send sins that don't seem that big or that maybe in themselves do seem pretty big. In fact, they seem so big that once we've dealt with that open sin, say adultery or stealing from the church or slandering the pastor, you know, the, the things that are, once we dealt with them, yeah, that was really bad. And I've now dealt with that. I've got really serious about that. I would never do that again. But have you dealt with what got you there? Mm. Have you really taken the time to figure out why you ended up there in the first place? What what walls and, and barriers did you drop way in the past, in your heart perhaps, that allowed you to walk into these sins now? It's It's, it's this ongoing thing called the Christian life. Yeah, and uh, it's it's often not fun. Um, it's often not fun. It's often hard, but there there is a certain joy and passion in pursuing the holiness of God in, in loving a holy God because He is holy, and we perceive that that holiness is a good thing. It's not who we are yet, but it's who He's making us to be. And every step of repentance pushes us, nudges us just a little more to what he's making us out to be yeah. when, he, when he appears, his coming. And then lastly, revenge. The New King James says vindication. The ESV says punishment. Vincent, in his word study, says meeting out justice, doing justice to all parties, making sure that justice is done. This may be public humiliation. I have to stand up in front of everyone and say, this is what I did, and so there's no confusion. Open confession. Okay, I called you all here because I need to tell you something. Financial restitution. Yeah, you know, I I, I did steal a thousand dollars, and I told God I'm sorry. So um, we're done, I guess. Did you get back the thousand dollars? Well, no, I said I'm sorry. Yeah, no. <laughs> Chuck Swindoll, in one of his uh, one of his simple books on grace, uh, gives this example. You walk out of the church parking lot, and you hear kind of a crash and a bang. As you look down the row of cars, and you see. Uh, a friend of yours, church, church member, 
scribbling something and, and leaving a note on your car, and and uh, he begins to pull away, and you see him leave, and you come to the car, and you see the fender has been dashed in because the guy backed up sloppily. But the note says, uh, sorry about the damage, but I've talked to God about it. We're all right. Isn't Grace wonderful? And he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> not particularly. <laughs> <laughs> not for me. I need a car. I need to get fixed. So that kind of thing. And again, antinomians will look at this and say, "You're talking legalism." No, we're talking heart change. And, and I think that maybe is the point where legalism doesn't get it because legalism is about external things. Yeah. And antinomianism is about external things. Antinomian wants to plead the heart. But it sh short circuits the heart's connection to reality. As yes. long as it's in my heart in the sense of some kind of sentiment and privately wished concern, that's all that matters. It need not come out in the open. Legalism is also not concerned with the heart in that if you have done the thing, then we're done. We don't need to pursue any further. I remember years ago at my previous school, there was a young man who we suspected was cheating. I mean, it's suspected in the sense that we're absolutely positive, but wanted to make sure we could prove it. And uh, he and his dad were, were coming to uh, to meet with us. And um, I, I just had a bad feeling. So I called a number of my students to me privately and said, look, do you know anything about this kid that you haven't told us? And one after one, they said, oh, yeah, he's the worst cheater ever. Huh. You know, so I got lots of new information and went into the meeting. And uh, the dad said, well, I talked to my son. He did admit to cheating on this, these two occasions. He's repented. So we're done here, right? He said, yeah, except for this and this and this and this and this. And the father got angry with me. So when, uh, one of his friends says, well, what do you want? Crocodile tears? I'm thinking, how about some real ones? Yeah. How about, how about realizing it? And how about you? Don't you understand that your son is, is not simply has lied. He is a liar. He is not cheated. He is a cheat. His character is in dire need of the gospel. But this man was, uh, his, his pastor called him a, a social antinomian. But I would also say he's a legalist. You, I have done, I've checked the boxes. I've met the external requirements. Uh, legalism and antinomianism meet. We invent our own rules so they're, we don't have to keep yeah. God's from, our heart, from out of the heart. Exactly. They're, they're two sides of the same coin. Yeah. The... Um, the Heidelberg Catechism, it's a confession of the Reformed churches of the continent of America, it says this, it calls repentance, heartfelt sorrow for sin, causing us to hate and turn from it always more and more. That's question and answer 89. The Westminster Confession says the repentance sinner grieves for and hates his sin <laughs> as to turn from them all unto God, purposing and endeavoring to walk with him in all the ways of his commandments. Now, there's traditional Reformed theology. And there's a union of heart and outward action. Both are required. And that's what makes it so hard. If we limit it to the heart, but not outward action, we can fake the heart. If we limit it to the outward action, but don't pursue the heart, we can fake outward action. It's when you unite the two that suddenly we are up against the, the horrible realities of our sin and our sinful nature and see our infinite need for Christ. It and is it, the truly hard way. Yeah. And it's the right way. It's the good way. So in the, in the original article, I listed some suggestions in for national repentance. I, I don't know that we need to pursue them because at this point, I think one of the things we've said render it rather obvious at each level, we need to get serious with God about our sins and about our disobedience, whether it's family with regard to our spouses and our children, whether it's our church, how is our church living up to what God says a church ought to be? Or are we cutting corners in order to increase numbers or because we love people and don't want to be judgmental? And then as, um, as a nation, we have huge policies embedded in our system that are anti-Christian, anti-Christ. And, and that's not particularly the place to start. Although as God gives us opportunity, we have a chance to abolish the public school system, our, our temples to, uh, to socialism and federal power or are the, uh, the laws favoring abortion. We can get rid of those. Obviously, we should. But that's, in general, that's the tail end of things. Repentance 
begins in our hearts with our, our concerns. Years ago, I conceived of writing an article titled, We Don't Want Revival. And the, the thesis was going to be, we don't re want revival out there because we don't want revival in here. If we wanted revival, yes. we'd go have one. We'd go home and we'd get our knees before God and we would, we would examine ourselves, uh, which is the hardest thing in the world to do. Yep. Uh, and But until we do that, it, there is a bit of hypocrisy about complaining about the sins of our national leaders in the media. Not to say that we can't call them to repentance too. Hey, repentance is for everybody. But it, there is this danger of guilt shifting, of pointing mm -hmm. the finger at people out there. They're the bad guys. If we could just get rid of the media, the press, if we could get rid of the bad guys in Washington or the uh, international bankers or the Marxists, or, you know, then everything would be great. No, then it'd be back on us. <clears throat> it'd be pretty clear where the problems are really coming from. Because somebody votes these people to office. Someone buys and listens to the media stuff. It's not more, not everyone not, who votes is voting with their noses held, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So God calls us to repentance, and, and yet, yeah, and then I think we have to close with this, uh, though. There are tender souls who truly want to repent. And the question becomes, have I repented enough? Well, the answer to that is no. <laughs> but, the, but the flip side of that is we are not saved by the degree and purity of our repentance. Yes. Salvation brings repentance just as it brings obedience, but we are, our salvation is never measured out in terms of that. It's an evidence, it's a fruit, uh, it is something in which we will continue to grow. But the person who keeps looking at his conscience and says, I've sinned again and again and again, I must not be a Christian. No, 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 brother, no. Uh, the very fact that you care, that sin grieves you, is evidence of the work of God in your heart. Because the unbeliever can skip through life with an occasional, oh, sorry, ran over your kid, but I'm sorry, I'm going on now, I have things to do. Uh, the Christian will be grieved for things to the, to the world seem very small and insignificant, but to us are huge because yeah. we know the honor of God and our fellowship with him is at stake. So this is this, we have to be careful to say this is not a program for justification, but rather an ongoing demonstration of the righteousness we have in Christ. Amen. It's even our repentance is something that is tainted by sin. Yeah. If we're going to if we're going to claim total depravity, using the 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 easy popular five points. Sure. Um, if you're going to claim that, you don't get to say, oh, except for this one thing, because yeah. then you're standing on the same shifting ground that the Arminians right. do when it comes to that first moment of repentance, right. and that's. You, you rightly criticize them. You should recognize it in yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So I think that's a good place to cut it because otherwise we will be here for another 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So uh, my recommendation this week is one that I've given before. It is a book by Sinclair Ferguson called The Whole Christ. Mm. Uh, it starts with a historical analysis of the what was it called again? The Marrow Controversy in the Church of mm. Scotland. Uh, but it really is about antinomianism versus legalism and avoiding both of those errors and, and what, what the gospel really is. And uh, th there's a lot of really great parts in there, but one of the, one of the relevant things that gets touched on, uh, at least as far as my memory is uh, saying it, is the idea of repentance and that you know you if we're talking about justification and we really really want to focus on keeping sola fide intact mm -hmm. then you can't say that you need to repent in order to be justified because that puts the order out mm -hmm. you you have to be justified which is to say converted as well before repentance even enters your mind, um, there was a uh, the the creed uh, of uh, this one small Scottish presbytery was called the Octorarder Creed, which I will never be able to pronounce as cool as Sinclair Ferguson pronounces <laughs> it. Which, in very confusingly set English, essentially says, "Do you need to repent in order to come to Christ?" And 
the depending on how you answer that you ended up on one of the two sides in this controversy and the the marrow men thomas boston and others came down and said you don't need to now you will and you should because that's a sign but you can't get that order out of the way and the people on the other side said who said yes would actually say things like you cannot tell unbelievers when you're evangelizing you can't tell them uh, to repent or that or it was something very basic to evangelism mm-hmm. that it just completely escaped my mind now. But they they got the order wrong mm-hmm. and it it messed with their very ability to complete the Great Commission. <laughs> uh, this isn't this isn't a ivory tower discussion. This mm-hmm. isn't a. Oh, you know, those those uh, MDivs, they're all at Westminster Seminary and they're talking about lapsarianism again. Mm-hmm. This is the gospel at stake. It is how you think about justification. So uh, that's my book recommendation. It will probably always be a recommendation. We should just put it on the web, like on our <laughs> podcast page. This is Brian's recommendation forever. But it bears it bear special mention this time. Greg? Unfortunately, I have not read about the marrow controversy. I know it's a thing. You know, it's popped up once or twice. I asked my pastor once in passing, and he either didn't have a ready a short answer or we didn't have time. I don't remember. Um, so I, what I'm going to say has nothing to do with anything you just said or anything that, that's in the book you just quoted. But there, there is this issue. Do Can you tell an unbeliever to repent and trust in Christ? And the answer has to be yes, because the apostles did. Now, does that imply they had the ability that unbelievers have the ability to respond? No, unless God gives it to them through the message you just preached. Yeah. And if God gives them the ability, He regenerates their hearts and gives them faith, then that faith will be a repentant faith. It will be a working faith. It will be a faith that is life changing. But the work of the spirit is through the gospel directly to the heart and it's our our one and only claim on it is faith in christ now we can talk then about what faith looks like and but we have to be careful not to say faith really means faith and no it's faith and it's faith alone but it, it faith does have a definition yeah and, and it has results and it has results and if we reach for christ as savior that kind of implies we're reaching for christ as savior from what? From sin, which means, why do I want to be saved from sin? Oh, because I realize sin at some level is a bad thing. If, if Even if I only realize it's taking me to hell and I don't want to go there, that's, <laughs> that's you know, a sort of repentance. And if I, now trusting in Christ as I, did, as I do this instant, realize I love Christ because of what he's done, and therefore I don't want to offend him, that too is repentance. Now, again, do we measure that out? Do we meet it out? Do we ask for details and specifics? No, because it's the faith. It's the laying hold of Christ, yeah. This, which is what saves us and binds us to Christ. But as, as all the report standards say, there is there is a connection here. And so um, wherever that would land me in this controversy, that's, that's what I, I think we have to insist on. Because I've seen this. I've seen people who cannot, who functionally cannot preach the gospel. Yep. In fact, I know of uh, one one dear couple. They were sweet, sweet people. Love the Lord. But as uh, we were visiting one day as elders, they admitted that they didn't do much evangelism for this reason. They were afraid they would come off sounding like Arminians. Uh, then sound like Arminians. <laughs> Don't. <sighs> come on. You, you, you offer them Jesus. And if you don't, if the words don't come out right, that's okay. God can work around that. You're not deliberately trying to be a heretic, so <laughs> there there is some grace for not trying to be a heretic on purpose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But when it stalls you to the point that you can't even tell people that Jesus saves and that you can have him, that's that's horrible. Anyway, uh I was thinking about recommending uh watching Life in Your Backyard because we have my daughter's been doing a lot of gardening and we now have she says Two pigeons, two scrub jays, two um, a mockingbirds, and two squirrels who I'm watching right now. They're just having a blast in our backyard. When we had a cat back there, <laughs> they couldn't do that. But now they're just chasing each other all around. So that, that's a good thing. But I think prim- my primary uh, recommendation I've been thinking about all morning because of, as I said earlier, issues of covenant continuity have been coming up. 
in and about me. You recommend reading the book of Hebrews with yeah. some attention and detail. You want to see how the two covenants connect and what is what does it mean for the new to be better without abolishing the old? That's the book where it all starts. And how is it that you can be in the covenant and not be saved? Well, it addresses that very plainly. What, it shows us that covenant life is more than divine election, that there is there's an inner eternal grace to those whom God has elected, but there that doesn't mean there's not also an outward showering of grace for those who are within the bounds of the covenant and who yet may come to faith in Christ or who may turn away in apostasy. Mm-hmm. As my wife says, if, if apostasy is not a real thing and if there's not an external side of the covenant, we can get rid of Hebrews. Yeah. <laughs> That's the main reason it was written, to show people that uh, you can be of the covenant and not in it. You can have faith in Christ, and, and or you can reject faith in Christ, and yet or not yet come to faith in Christ, and yet be within the external influences of the covenant, which may indeed lead you to Christ in God's good time. Yep. But the, 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 the presumption to say, well, you're in the covenant, you're not. Well, why Why am not? Uh, your, your, your profession and your testimony is not good enough to convince us. We, we are not sure that yours is a real profession. Well, that's what destroyed Puritanism in America, trying to get at the heart by subtle questions and reading the soul. Mm-hmm. And it never works. It is thoroughly destructive uh, because God's ways are not ours. You know, we cannot read the heart. We cannot tell who is saved and who is not. And to pretend that we can is thoroughly destructive of covenant life. And it arrogates us to uh, presumptions of, of Godhood, that I can actually read your heart and tell whether or not you're saved. So anyway, Hebrews will help you with all of that. It combines faith and works, predestination and covenant living, and above all, a Christ who has in fact come and who has brought fullness to all the promises. Very good. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining me for this conversation, Greg. It was a very good topic to discuss today. For everyone else, thank you for listening. Uh, We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to follow us, you can do so on our YouTube channel, through Rumble. You can follow our Facebook page. And if you like the podcast and want to subscribe, uh, you can do so through any number of podcast catchers that we we exist on. If you have a particular one you like, we're probably on there. If we're not, please uh, drop us an email and let us know. Our email is haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Um, if you'd like to support us financially, you can do so at anchor.fm forward slash halting towards Zion. And a hefty thank you to our financial supporters for supporting us financially so that we can afford all the software we use to edit these episodes and get them out to you. And thank you to David Maxson, who is the one doing all the editing and getting these episodes out to you. We'll see you next time. Thank you.